Hello, this is Austin Shoup, teaching assistant to the University of Kentucky, here to talk about the snare drum portion of the 2019 All-State Secondary Audition. Um, right off the bat, what you have to pay attention to in the first two measures is that you have three separate dynamics that are all discernible from each other. You start with that mezzo forte with a pair of accents that are strong without being mistaken for forte, and then immediately have to step off the accent move to piano, and then crescendo back up to forte, which is accented. So already you're talking about different kinds of articulations and dynamics all in one small section of the piece. So you need to make sure you have three distinct dynamics that are discernible to someone who wouldn't even have the music in front of them. Later in the piece, when you have more accents intermixed with, you know, unaccented notes, um, you want to make sure that your accents aren't necessarily an accent tap interpretation where you have two completely different, you know, stick heights that sit in two different dynamic bands so that everything kind of sounds at these two different levels. What you need to think about is, is having the accent as an emphasized note, or many people talk about the accents as being a higher pitch than everything around it. So instead of thinking of louder and softer, you think of brighter and darker or higher and lower. It gives the the section just a little bit more musical of an approach that's more befitting of this in the you know, audition environment, large ensemble environment. Towards the end of the snare drum portion of the video, we have a series of 16th notes decrescendoing, which is met by a buzz roll bringing the music back up, and then another series of 16th notes decrescendoing back down and the buzz roll bringing it back up. And there's even some accents intermixed here. And the instinct is going to be to accent the release of every roll because you're coming out of something that is often a bit more tense in the hand. So something that would be really clever to do is to remove all buzzes and all accents. Start it at an established forte, which should be the same forte from the second measure, and then decrescendoing on 16th notes, bringing the crescendo back up on 16th notes, and then back down again on 16th and yet back up again. No accents, no buzz rolls, just to establish where those dynamics all fit. Where is the bottom of the, of the decrescendo? Where is the top of the crescendo? Once you're comfortable with that, add the accent. Notice that in the 16th notes in the middle, in between the rolls, there is no accent. So you're going to have to find a way to make sure that, that is different than the accent at the beginning of this passage and the accent at the very end of the snare drum piece. Um, once you have done this, then add the roll back in and adjust your roll speed to match so that you have a smooth roll through the crescendo. This whole process is just to help put your ear around where are my dynamics and then where are my accents and where aren't my accents and then to finally add the last level so that you have this, you know, the piece as it's written on the page but with very, very clear indicators at the top and bottom of the range. So for the xylophone portion of the secondary etude, A, beware of the tempo. It's written fairly quick, so um, you want to make sure you spend a lot of time practicing slow and getting it accurate and placing all of your dynamics and all of your articulations and all of your stickings at a relatively slow tempo so that everything is exactly where you want it, and then add the speed. The temptation is to try to put it where it should be should be, um, but honestly, like a musical performance that is close to tempo is superior to a fast, sloppy performance that was achieved through shortcuts. Um, so that's the first thing to know. As far as the music itself, beware of your dynamics. It kind of sneaks up on you, and the xylophone being so loud and so ticky, you have to be very careful about your fortes. They can often be overplayed. Um, mezzo forte middle of the instrument, middle of the range, and then establishing a piano that you can play at speed. 
So you're going to need to spend a little bit of time working for that. Stickings. This piece works really well, mostly alternated. There are a few points where you need a double stick to get through the, the passage. I highly recommend making sure that the double sticks occur on longer notes, like eighth notes. Doubles, you know, double stickings have a tendency to decrescendo unless you add energy to it. And the easier thing is to make sure that you are alternating and placing the doubles where they don't need to be rushed or hurried. There's a couple places where I found that it was best to keep the double in inside the 16th notes, such as the second beat of the third line first measure, where you have to come into this E flat fairly quiet, and coming across yourself is just going to be a bit strange. So I purposely set myself up to land on that low E flat with the left, and then double the F and G, and then bring the left across, so that the scale in thirds immediately preceding is in a right hand lead. Notice I placed the double in the same manual, and not across any strong beats. Beat two is here, and then E and A, uh, and then a single right here. So you have to be that kind of detailed with choosing where to stick. I see a lot of students at the high school level making kind of interesting choices. And yes, the note accuracy, the rhythm accuracy will be there, but then the phrasing won't be right, or the dynamics won't be right, because the double sticks are just in really disadvantaged positions. Be thoughtful about them and keep them to a minimum. Finally, in terms of um, sound, first thing that you need is to make sure that you have a decent set of mallets. Uh, you don't want to go too brittle and too hard because then it's just going to be screamingly loud and you don't have a lot of tone, but you don't want to be too far to the other end where you're playing with a soft rubber that has more contact sound than tone. Um, I'm opting for something that's a little bit on the hard side, but it's weighted so I don't have to turn the wrist too hard, but everyone's kind of got something that works for them. Plastic is ideal. Not like super, super hard plastic, but not brass, not rubber, not anything in the extremes. Um, the other thing to be aware of is grip making sure that you keep a relaxed grip and that you only utilize lots of speed and velocity on accented notes, such as the end. You'll notice I move fairly quickly through those just to bring the accent out in addition to the fortissimo. But everything else should stay fairly relaxed and smooth so that you have a very musical tone rather than a very aggressive tone. And that'll ultimately be more pleasing for your, for your adjudicators. So for the cymbal portion of your secondary etude, which keep in mind, if you're doing keyboard, it's at a different tempo than the snare drum one. So I just recorded around 120 beats per minute. Some people will be expected to do it at 132. Um, but right off the bat, you're being asked to play an accented forte. So this is a fairly quick move of the cymbals towards each other and apart to help create a brighter sound compared to at the very next two measures you're being asked to play at a mezzo forte. So not only is that a smaller motion, but it's a little bit slower because there's no accent until the fifth measure where you do have that accent and the faster motion comes back, but it's still at a mezzo forte. Now, this next, this fifth measure presents an interpretation problem because in the sixth measure, you have to play at a piano. For many people, the mezzo forte will ring over across the piano and you are going to have to dampen the cymbals to take the ring out of the air so you can restart at a piano. Problem with that is you're being asked specifically in the fifth measure to let the cymbals ring. I opted to dampen because usually in larger spaces in a full ensemble setting the resonance of the room kind of covers up the gap um, and I find it a little bit nicer to start with a clean piano rather than trying to push the cymbal through the ring. The alternative is, is you overshoot the piano just a little bit and move a little faster to help it articulate through the resonance, but you're going to find that that's a very loud approach. Um, from there on out, you're back to unaccented, keeping your speed fairly slow and just moving the motions bigger and bigger and bigger until you have that last accent where you bring some speed back into it. That covers the playing, before, uh, the playing portion, but other things to consider are, for example, the symbols that you have. I have here a set of 18 inch medium light symbols. They're a little bit on the lighter, the thinner side of the spectrum. And that allows them to speak a little cleaner and it takes a little bit of weight out of the system so I can be a little more nimble. It allows the resonance to be a little shorter so I, can, I don't have to work so hard to hear the clarity. Um, if you have something smaller than an 18, that's even better. I just don't have access to something like that right now. Um, for those of you that have choices, 
go with the thing that allows you to be nimble and clear rather than the thing that sounds like a full crash cymbal. Another consideration is that every pair of cymbals has a high cymbal and a low cymbal. Normally I would put the, the high pitch cymbal on top, it's a little heavier and it brings out the articulation and the brightness of a crash, but for something like this I'll put the thinner one up top just to help again with staying light and nimble and allowing for some control. Plus in many cases you're auditioning in smaller rooms and having the thinner cymbal on top keeps the sound just a little mellower. So for the triangle portion of the secondary etude, for both versions, keyboard and snare drum, that's at 116. For the snare drum take, this is going to be almost imperceptible. It's like a loss of energy, so just relax a little bit. Um, for the mallet etude, this is going to be a pretty substantial drop down. Um, so you're going to want to spend some time with the metro and make sure you lock this down and the relationship between the two. I would argue it's not absolutely critical that you get the exact metronome markings on the page, but that you keep them in a fair relationship, whether that's mathematically where you always make sure that they are the same number of beats per minutes apart, or if you actually go through the math to make that an even ratio, that's up to you. Um, some considerations is right off the bat you're being asked to do a mezzo forte roll. So this isn't a forte roll. Rolls are fairly easy at forte because you have to move quite a bit. Um, and then at piano some people have found some tricks to just get a really easy piano roll out of it. This is mezzo forte. It's kind of right in the middle so you don't want to be too soft or too loud. Again keeping your dynamics in relationship to each other. Um, and then almost immediately you're asked to articulate some 16th notes at a fairly high rhythm on this instrument you, you can double mount it and drum on the top on the closed arm, but this is usually not a great sound. So if at all possible, articulating your 16th notes by moving up and down is ideal. This does mean that you're going to have to make some decisions about your tone quality based on the angle here, and we'll come back to that. For the day crescendo, some triangles might ring longer than others, um, so you're going to make sure that you do something to take some of the resonance out. For me, I take just the little peak of the pad of my ring finger and I touch it to the triangle and that takes just enough resonance out where I you know I can get the day crescendo going down you can still hear the articulation through the resonance if you overdo it then the triangle becomes a bit pitchy and you don't get a great sound if you underdo it it's not effective so you just need to find that balance for you and your triangle um, as far as getting the sound quality that you need, making sure that you're at a 45 degree angle. If you come in at this angle, you're going to get a very clear pitch, which sounds beautiful in some contexts, but very frequently is a bit grating on the ear. You're just getting this metallic sound at one pitch for a long time. You also get the same effect coming in flat. If you come in at a 45, you're going to get a much more complex tone that's a little bit more pleasing to the ear. It's also more likely to blend with the ensemble. So for auditions, they may or may not be looking for that. Um, the problem this presents is if you have a 45 degree angle on the bottom arm, it's not exactly a 45 degree angle on this arm. So you might have to play with this just a little bit when you're articulating up and down to make sure that you get a fairly even sound on both. Some people do opt to come in perfectly flat here and they'll take the sacrifice and tone for the consistency and articulation that this brings. That's not wrong, it's a different approach. Final considerations. Making sure that you have a triangle of decent quality but then a clip. It doesn't need to be something that costs a lot of money. This is a three dollar clamp that I bought at a hardware store and some like they call it notch cable tie. Um, you see it with some price tags or fishing line works as well. Something that's plastic and, f and touches the triangle fairly lightly. Uh, what you don't want is a shoestring or something cloth or thick cord, something that's going to mute the triangle. Those are usually bad choices. You already kind of have to do some muting to get through this etude. Um, you don't want to add more to that. That's just going to be bad.